we are going to bring in Attorney General Levin Camacho to talk trash. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. No, we're actually talking about uh, the Ordot dump and the latest filing uh, in the U.S. Supreme Court. Good morning, AG. Good morning, Sabrina. Good morning, Andy. Good morning. Now, this is just, well, wh whenever I hear about the Ordot dump, when I first got to Guam over 20 or so years ago, the Ordot dump was one of the stories that I was assigned to cover. And this one w w was when it wasn't covered on a daily basis. So going there uh, to the dump, it was just terrible. Uh, it was just like the worst assignment any reporter could do. Uh, because, like I said, it just smelled so bad. The flies were ginormous. But, you know, I have a, a friend, a family that lives uh, by the Ordot dump now, and, and it's just a mountain. You can't smell anything at all. But the case is still kind of unresolved in terms of uh, the, the holding the federal government accountable. And so if you could just share uh, with us and bring us up to speed with this uh, latest briefing. Sure. So as you mentioned, this has been going on for, for decades now and actually goes back to a while back. But I think <laughs> 2002, was when, 2002 was when EPA sued the government of Guam um, about the ORDOT dump. And I guess, you know, relevant to our case, they actually identified that the Navy was somewhat responsible for the, the pollution and the contamination up there. But they elected not to sue uh, the Navy or make them part of that case. And that was under the Clean Water Act. So 2004, we have a consent decree. Uh, 2014, actually, under my predecessor, Elizabeth Barrett Anderson, Attorney General Barrett Anderson, uh, we sued the Navy, asking that they pay their fair share of what it would cost to clean it up. So the price tag is about $160 million. And as we pointed out in our briefing, that's about 20% of the total of our budget for last year. So it's, a, it's an extremely large amount of money. Um, and, and I just want to be clear that what we're asking for is for the Navy to pay their fair share. So once we get to figuring out just how much they contaminated and how much is responsible, you know, the government of Guam contributed to it. Uh, then we can figure out, okay, of this 160 million, how much did the Navy pay and how much did the government of Guam pay? At this point, the Navy hasn't paid a dime. And we've been solely responsible as a government of Guam for pay, paying for the cleanup costs. So that's what this, this action is really meant to do. Just Navy pay what your fair share is for using the dump for decades, um, starting in the 40s, going through the Vietnam War and also the Korean War and you know, DDT, Agent Orange, I believe, were all discharged at the ORDOT dump at some point, it's unlined. So we filed our, our petition with the Supreme Court in September. The DOJ filed their opposition brief. We just wrapped up briefing last week, which is where you guys got the press release. And we are now on schedule to be presented to justices the first week of January at their conference. Um, so just a little bit of procedure, it'll take four of them to decide that they want to accept our case for us to move to the next stage. And only a very small percentage of cases get accepted every year. I believe the estimate is 70 to 80 out of 7,000 to 8,000 petitions are accepted. But the one thing that we have, two things going for us, we actually have a situation in our case where there's a split or disagreement between three or four of the different circuits, federal circuits across the country on how to uh, interpret these environmental documents and statutes and when you, you need to file your case. So that's what we're presenting and we're, we're hoping they take it and then we'll move on to the next phase, which would be briefing on the merits of our case. Mm -hmm. And you said the the, the feds had filed, uh, the U.S. Department of Justice filed their opposition. Was it mainly because of, you know, well, Gov Guam, you, you had your opportunity to do so. It's been X amount of years, um, so it's not our fault. Yeah, so the, the main theory is that, and this is where it just gets, you know, when EPA sued Guam, they sued us under the uh, Clean Water Act, and then we sued them under CERCLA, a different environmental statute, which has different remedies that are available. So the argument that we've made is, well, how would we have known to file the CERCLA case in a CWA case? Mm -hmm. And there's actually uh, one federal circuit that's held that, that uh, one agreement doesn't trigger your rights to or your requirement to bring a lawsuit under a separate law. So that, that is really the gist, the gist of it. Um, the other main point is the consent decree basically allowed the, the, um, the United States to bring us back into court. We weren't done. We just agreed to do certain things. And if we didn't comply, then they had the ability to bring us back in and say, no, Guam, you guys didn't do it. So we argued it goes both ways. You can't say you've resolved liability, it's a settlement agreement, 
but then point out that both sides can kind of come back and, and reopen this thing if needed. So those are the two main points that we've asked the Supreme Court of the United States to review and to settle uh, basically across all the federal circuits. Mm -hmm. what, what was that circuit you said? The second circuit is the one that's held that um, a non circ so a CWA agreement wouldn't trigger a CERCLA suit or case. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sorry, but what, what a state or jurisdiction? Is that? I, I don't know what states would make up the second circuit. Oh. I know that the, on the other side, the third, the ninth, and the seventh, and the DC circuit now have, have held that a non circla agreement can trigger CERCLA. Um, ninth circuit is where we fall under. So if you hear about the ninth circuit, that, that's yeah. where. That's why, that geographically, that's the where we fall under. So I'm not as familiar with all the other circuits okay. and where geographically they fall under. I, I just know Guam because that's where we get sworn in to practice federal law. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of bring us up to speed with uh, the, the consent decree then and, and where we are and and has uh, the control uh, been turned over to the government of Guam? You know, I, I'm an, I, again, once, once we were sworn in, I know that a governor and lieutenant governor were very involved at the at the onset and they were able to get operations transferred away from the receiver to Guam Solid Waste. So that was a huge win. Um, I think we're just trying to wrap up a few pieces, which were contracts that were negotiated by the receiver mm -hmm. and to transfer them to GSWA. But, you know, without COVID hitting, I, you know, the optimism was that they would have actually terminated the receivership completely this year. So th there may be a few more hearings that need to happen just to make sure that everything administratively is wrapped up. But my understanding is operationally, things have, have been turned over to GSWA for some, quite some time now. Okay. How long would it typically take for uh, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, to, to make a decision on, on whether or not they would accept uh, a case? So they're set to have their conference. We should know within a few weeks whether or not we're going to be accepted. Okay. And who, who will be the one to argue the case before the U.S. Supreme Court? Will it be you or? Uh, we, we have a uh, counsel who's been involved in that. So, you know, I, I may, we'll have to cross that bridge when we get there. <laughs> hopefully they accept, hopefully we're one of the chosen few that gets to move forward. Um, we haven't really worked through the logistics that far down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, well, why do you think that, uh, you know, we didn't pursue this uh, years back? Well, part of it is resources, Sabrina. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but, you know, um, just having experts on our side who do deal with this, we've had to outsource this litigation, um, and it's not unusual, but it's one of those things where <clears throat> we now as an office have taken on, we've, we've sued for NEPA, we've sued for PFAS, but when you have a consumer protection division of four attorneys, and they do an amazing job with our deputy, Fred Nishihara down there, but, you know, you need a team of experts, and especially when you get into a lot of the science involved in figuring out just how much contamination is going on. So part of it's going to be resources. Um, part of it, quite honestly, was just we, we recognize that there was a problem in ORDOT that we've been aware of. And, you know, you're not thinking about, oh, who else should I be suing and bringing, bringing into this? So, uh, but at the end of the day, we, we believe that CERCLA does provide us the ability to go forward. We have at least two circuits in, on each of those issues that agree with our position. Um, and we, we hope the Supreme Court accepts and finds in our favor. Right. I, I guess we all kind of hope so, too. Um, I did also want to uh, congratulate you. Uh, and, and one of the other reasons why uh, we wanted to bring you on the show was uh, uh, being uh, the first elected attorney general from Guam to serve on the National Association of Attorneys General Executive Committee. So congratulations to you on that. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah, it's... Um we got a call at about 4.45 in the morning from General Racine out of the District of Columbia asking if I'd be willing. And uh, he's a very he's a very nice man. And you know, I said, okay, and he, oh, just so you know, your my other two appointments are the AG from Delaware, Kathy Jennings, and the AG from New York, Tish James. And I said, oh, we're all about the same, you know, Guam, New York, and Delaware. <laughs> we're, we're very similar in, in a lot of ways. Um, but you know, quite honestly, Sabrina, I think they got tired of me sending emails every time we circulated some of these national policy papers and reminding them there are territorial AGs as well. So NAG is made up of 56 AGs, the 50 states, DC, and the five territories. And you know, some of the things that we've done uh, last week, the CARES extension. Well, hopefully, we'll see what happens with the, mm -hmm. the COVID, the CARES Act, or the COVID relief. But you know, I, I think over about 40 AGs signed a letter, sent it to Congress, asking for a CARES Act extension. Um, we also have done things broadband, opioids, um, but I, I'm not joking. Every time they send one of those out, I always say, make sure you add and territorial because uh, so often we're not considered. And 
a cool thing, I'm not sure if you guys caught this, but we were part of the Facebook uh, suits that were filed with these multi-state litigation. And whoever prepared their graphic, Big Guam bigger than Florida. So, you know, uh, Jen was teasing me, like, you know, they talk about putting Guam on the map and you guys have succeeded in making Guam even bigger than Florida and Hawaii. So uh, we'll, we'll add that to the things that we've done. But, uh, you know, I, I, it is really an honor to serve on the NAG committee. And there's a lot of great things that territories can have a voice in some of these national policies. Um, General Racine is focused on hate crime and racial justice as his presidential initiative, which is relevant to us as, may, as much as we may not think it is. Um, and he, in particular, he's talked about indigenous communities. He wants to look at the way Native Americans were treated, um, going into slavery. So there's there's a lot of opportunity for us to raise territorial issues in, in those discussions. And I'm hoping being part of the NAG uh, executive committee will give us a, a little bit more opportunity to give input. Right. And, we're like the we're like Peggy Peggy uh, Schuyler. If you watch Hamilton, right? <laughs> the and Peggy. You know, it's always <laughs> Elizabeth, uh, Eliza, and Peggy. So we're, mm. we're, we're we're the equivalent of Peggy, I guess, in these things. <laughs> And I mean, it, it, indigenous issues, that's kind of right up your alley with uh, the work you've done with the the Pocket, right? The Pocket uh, lawsuit. So. Well, and, and I'm hoping, you know, you're seeing more of these territorial cases come up. Um, and I'm hoping that we, we had for a Haida petition when I was on a few months ago with you, mm-hmm. Guam and the NMI have joined to, to jointly petition. Uh, I have a feeling that you're going to be seeing a lot more territorial cooperation with our office and, and other territorial AG's offices, because we do have a lot in common and we benefit from having multiple territories coming forward and saying, hey, it's just not the 160,000 in Guam or the, I, you know, it's, I was surprised at how many people live in the Virgin Islands. I don't know much about it, but they have a lot of the same things they're dealing with, uh, we're dealing with when it comes to SSI benefits, the denial of federal benefits for those who are in need, those with disabilities, um, down to school lunch programs. They have similar legal issues when it comes to things like lunch reimbursement. So you know, I'm hoping that we're able to, through NAG, work with these other territories and amplify our voices. So it's just not a lone territory out there kind of by itself. Yeah. Right. I, I did want to ask, since I have you on, we're uh, under P, we're still under PCOR 1, but there's several restrictions that have been eased. Um, what, what's the status of the AG's office? Are you guys still uh, open, teleworking? We're, we're open up 50% now, um, except for those divisions, which we need to have more staff come in just to central services. So our child support has been in actually for quite some time now um, to handle PUA and, and any um, any garnishments that are happening to get those money out, those, those funds out, because we know how important they are. Our criminal division, prosecution division has been in. Um, our litigation division, every, every division here has been busy. So we, we try to comply with the 50% as much as we can. I do want to say, you know, we, we have our phone numbers available on our website and our direct extensions. We will be updating those directories soon so that you can actually dial directly into a division without having to enter an extension. And, and hopefully that's this week. We can get that out to you guys. Um, but we, we receive over 150 calls a day. And I know it's frustrating to not have a, a human being answer the phone, but I just ask people if you can send emails out. All of our emails are published on our website, oagguam.org. Um, and if you're not finding, if you're not getting a response within a few days, please email ag at oagguam.org and we can follow up for you. Um, we're doing our best, but again, when you have 150 calls a day and we're at 50% staff, it just makes it very difficult to to take as many calls as we would like to take. But we want to get answers to people who are calling in for with questions. Mm-hmm. Well, we're about to close out uh, 2020. Thank goodness. Um, you know, in, in hindsight, do you have you learned any lessons uh, this past year? I'm sure everybody has uh and what are you looking forward to in 2021 i i gotta say sometimes a necessity you know for, forces innovation on us and i would never have thought that we would be here appearing via zoom um, but remote work capabilities we actually launched launched our it's funny we, we've sued google for the uh dominating the search the search uh, engine market but we also rolled over to g suites um maybe a week before we were in lockdown the first time around. So, you know, we, we've been able to leverage that. Uh, so I, I, I just think it shows that we can be re- resilient and we can be in- innovative when, when we need to be. Uh, and, and this coming year, it's gonna be just making sure that we, we can continue to provide our team with the resources they need to do their jobs. I mean, I'm excited. There's a lot of tech stuff that we're gonna be rolling out this year that we'll be able to share with you guys soon, I hope. Um, 
And with the vaccine, I just ran into someone in the elevator. It's funny, we have staff here that I don't know what they look like uh, (laughs) because I've just seen the the whites of their eyes. Um, But I'm hoping at some point in the near future, we can can all get together again and and do it safely. Uh, But three W's, you know, I'm going to continue emphasizing it. My, my dad or my, my son teases me that I'm, I, I have a, I have dad law. I impose dad law. Whenever anyone comes to the house, they're wearing a mask. They got to wash their hands. So I think he recognizes that uh, I'm, I'm a stickler for rules and it's for a reason, right? We've been able to get our car score down and our, our positivity rate down to a manageable level. So I'm, I'm hoping schools open up again. Uh, yeah. If I can lobby for that, you know, and yeah. I, um, I need to bring it to you, Brina. Can you imagine if this happened when we were in school? I mean, oh I think you're gosh. about the same age, you know? It's like, it would have been a one-year-long summer vacation. So <laughs> in some ways, I'm very grateful for all the teachers that are doing their best to educate our kids and all the parents um, that are teacher, lunchroom lady, school aid, everything, right? Uh, but it just, you know, what a time. To, at least it's better now than 1993. I would have yeah. gotten even worse grades, probably. So. <laughs> All right, uh, Levin, thank you so much. By the way, you know, the local judiciary, the federal uh, judiciary, they have uh, written letters to the governor uh, to kind of move up uh, the line for uh, vaccinations. Um, is that something that uh, you guys would be included in or or do you plan on maybe asking if uh, the AG and the prosecution can move up as well? You know, I want to make sure our field people are getting it first. That's just uh, our investigators, process officers are out there dealing with people. Um, I, I do think it's important to get vaccinated, but yeah, it's just one of those things where I'm willing to wait until my folks who are out there dealing with folk, with people, the public, mm-hmm. and probably are much higher risk at, at contracting it from others get it. So I'm willing to wait my turn. All right. It's not a problem. All right. Thanks, uh, AG. Happy New Year to you and the family. Thank you. Happy New Year to you as well. All right. Take care. Yes. All right, uh, checking in with uh, Attorney General Levin Camacho, talking trash with him about uh, the filing uh, in the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court. We're just going to have